Welcome. I am Ryan Holger with TEC. Uh, this is a repeat of a uh, online broadcast that we did with Peoples and North Shore Gas for the Trade Ally event in September. There were some technical issues on that platform, so they asked us to repeat it again on another platform. And since I use GoToWebinar every day, uh, I decided to launch it on this one so I can control all the variables. So this is a Peoples Gas, North Shore Gas uh, repeat from September. The topic at that point in time, and still is very trendy, obviously, is COVID-19 and with a specific focus on fresh air and ERVs. That's the tie in with the utility discussion here. So I'm going to keep going through stuff here as things come up and you have questions, please type them in the chat box and I'll glance over there every once in a while to see if anything came up. Additionally, some of you registered for PDH hours. So when you register, there was a question that said, do you need a PDH certificate for Illinois or Wisconsin professional engineering? And if you said yes to that, then there are a couple requirements for you. Um, one, you have to be engaged in the webinar. Obviously, you can't just log in and then take a nap. And then two, there's going to be five pop-up questions that occur throughout the topic, throughout the hour. Uh, and you have to answer those uh, in order to receive PDH credit. That's how I can later on prove to anyone who needs me to verify that you, in fact, intended. So if you need PDH qu credits, make sure you answer those questions. Everyone's welcome to answer them because quiz questions are fun. Uh, but the P's need to do it. All right, here we go. So these are the five things that we're going to try to address today in this discussion, uh, all of related to COVID or specifically SARS-CoV-2, which everybody knows the whole discussion on that, so I don't have to describe that anymore these days. Uh, we're going to decide if filters can catch COVID, if UV lights can kill COVID, if humidity can minimize it, and if fresh air and EIVs can dilute it down. And then we'll also talk about a couple other things that, uh, that you may have heard of that might help along with the discussion. So first up is filters. So a little quick summary on how filtration actually works. There's all kinds of filters that you could be utilizing. When I decide to use a filter to catch stuff out of the air, step one is determining how small is the stuff that I would like to catch. So uh, this is a chart that we use quite often in a lot of uh, indoor air quality discussions, showing the different sizes of various types of particles. Uh, the unit of measure is microns. It goes from 0 0.0001, super small number, over to 1,000, which is also a small number, by the way. So on the high end of the scale, we have things like hair, sand, pollen. Uh, in the middle of the scale, we have things like bacteria, mold, dust, and so on. And then down on the small end, we have stuff like viruses. And then really small, we have things like gases, which we're not going to be able to really catch with a filter because air is also a gas, and I don't want to design a filter that catches all of the air. There's other stuff you can do for gases. Um, but filtration is not going to be one of those solutions. So how small is this stuff really? If we look at it visually, this entire large circle is one pollen, right? So that's something over here that's relatively large in this discussion, something you can actually see with your eyeball. Uh, something that's smaller, bacteria, and something super small might be a virus. When we talk about the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically, this is his relative size. So this black blob on the right is PM10, so particulate matter 10 micron size. And this one over here is 2.5 micron size. Those are common measurement sizes that you might see referenced in different studies or even on the, uh, the weather app on your phone when there's high particulate days. Uh, a red blood cell, for reference, is smaller than PM10. Over here, this blue dot is bacteria, which is even smaller. And then not this big red and gray circle being COVID, but that little tiny dot is COVID, and that's just a blow-up view of it. So that's how small this stuff is. It's significantly smaller than bacteria, making it very challenging to catch. Now, with that being said, as far as viruses go, it's kind of big. Um, on my scale I showed you before, it's over on the far right-hand side of the scale for viruses. So it's kind of right there between most viruses and bacteria. It's, it's squeezed in between there in terms of size. So the good news is it's a fairly large virus, especially because it's and trained in, in basically snot, right, in, in respiration and vapor from your face. Uh, so it's easier to catch because of that. But it's still really small, and it is still very challenging to catch. So mechanical filters, how do they actually work? They use four different mechanisms to catch stuff. First one's impingement. This one's super easy for me to describe. This blue circle here, this fiber, could be a piece of fiberglass. It could be plastic, uh, some type of polymer. It's something that's built into my filter, interwoven in there. And then for this purpose is my particulate coming into the air system is dust. So he's moving along the airstream over here. He had to head on collision with the fiber. 
He sticks right in the fiber. He crashed into the brick wall. That's impingement. Interception means I don't have a head-on collision with the brick wall. I have more of a glancing blow. So it's like you're getting on the interstate. You weren't paying attention. Your car grinds along the guide rail. And as it's grinding along the guide rail, that friction slows it down. That's kind of what this is here. So it didn't hit a head-on collision. It kind of had a glancing blow. But the friction between the fiber and the dust particle is enough to slow that guy down and bring him to a grinding halt. Straining is the easiest one to explain. Um, so if you got a, a, a spaghetti pot, you dump it into the strainer. The water is small. It fits through the holes. The noodles are big. They don't fit through the holes. So same thing happens here. The air, the air molecules are small. They fit through the gap. The dust and other debris, particulates, are not small. They don't fit through the gap. So this dust comes along. He can't squeeze through there. His butt's too fat. He clogs up the hole and he doesn't get through. Thereby, I caught the dust. Now, the penalty to that is, now that that dust is there, air can't get through that spot anymore either. So the more dirt and debris I gather up on the face of the filter, the harder it's going to be for air to get through. And until I get to a point where I'm going to say, okay, time to change the filter. This isn't working anymore. But up until that point, the dirtier the filter gets, the better it gets at catching stuff. Right? Every time one of these holes is plugged with a piece of debris, other debris can't fit through it anymore. So the dirtier the filter, the better the filter, until the point when the filter can't move the air that I need anymore, or the fan energy to push the air through there is too high, then I'm gonna say, okay, good job filter, you're done, time to put a new filter in. There's a trade off there of energy cost, airflow versus uh, ability to catch stuff. The fourth one is kind of the hardest one to explain. Uh, this is diffusion. So in order to kind of grasp this one a little bit, we first have to talk about really small stuff. So I got rid of dust on this slide and now it says virus on here instead. Um, it could be even something smaller than that if we wanted it to be like a VOC or something. When things get really, really tiny, a couple things happen. First off, the smaller something is, if I have airflow moving through the space, the smaller it is, the less force the airflow is gonna exert on that thing, right? If you don't believe me, think of a sail ship and you put the sail up and have this giant sail here and the wind catches it and moves it along. We'll put the sail down and now all the wind is blowing against the mast only, it doesn't move it very much, right? A lot of the air just goes right around it. So really, really small things, the airflow goes around it for the most part. So it doesn't, it doesn't get entrained in the air very well. It's not that it won't go in the air and move with the air at all. It's just not gonna do it very much. It doesn't really care about airflow all that much. Additionally, really small stuff doesn't have a lot of natural forces. So for example, gravity and my body, the earth and my body are pulling on each other. Now, I'm pretty small and the earth is pretty massive. So we're both pulling on each other, but I'm moving towards the earth when I fall down, when I trip and fall, I'm falling to the earth. The earth isn't really coming up to me. My body is pulling the earth up. It just isn't doing anything because my mass is small, the earth is large. But when it comes to one of these little tiny viruses, his mass is really, really small. It's essentially rounding off to zero, almost no mass. So the attraction force between the virus and the earth is pretty minimal. So really small stuff floating in the air doesn't really get entrained into the airflow very well, and it doesn't fall down to the ground very well. If it fell down to the ground, it'd be easy to vacuum up, sweep up, wipe up, but it doesn't. And if it got stuck in the airflow, it'd be easy to get back to the filter, but it doesn't. So how do these little things move around? Primarily, they move around with Brownian motion. What does that mean? That means little tiny molecules hit each other, they collide, and when they do, they fly off in different directions. And those little collisions are happening all the time. Here, 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 here. They're all bouncing around off each other. That has a significantly larger influence on the movement of small particles than airflow or gravity does. However, some of these things are gonna make their way back to the filter because they're all over the place, right? They make their way back to the filter. They're bouncing around, not really caring about airflow. And then when they get up next to the filter and close to it, now the mass of the filter and the mass of the virus, because they're so close to each other, there can be a little bit of attraction there and enough to kind of cling those guys together. We'll come back to that topic and revisit it again. I don't see any questions typed in at the moment. If you have questions, uh, please send them in and we'll do our best to address them. So our filters have what's called a MERV rating. This has been for the past 20 plus years, the ASHRAE rating standard for filtration. Uh, so the MERV rating scale goes from one to 20 with one being the worst filter 20 being the best filter in terms of the size of things that it can catch. And then we have a little kind of scale on here to help illustrate. As I move up the MERV scale, I can catch smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller things. How small? 
I go back to my scale over here, if I had say a MERV seven or eight, which is kind of like a low end, like rooftop type filter, that's a MERV three or a micron three to 10 type range. So I'm catching stuff like this, hair, pollen, sand, I'm catching with a MERV eight filter. I'm not getting the little stuff though. Uh, if you look at the ASHRAE recommendations right now related to COVID specifically, the recommendation is MERV 14. And then it has like a little caveat that says, if you can't handle the pressure drop of MERV 14, we suggest maybe you try MERV 13. And we'll address that a little bit more as we move along later on, on why there's that kind of gap. But let's, for right now, let's just kind of assume the ASHRAE uh, recommendation is 13.5. It's somewhere between 13 and 14, if you will. That's the 0.1 to 0.3 size stuff. So that's the stuff right here really kind of on the tail end and really to get to the point one stuff i really want to be more like mer 15 maybe even 16. so i might get some of these viruses i might not and it really kind of depends on whether they're still entrained in moisture in water vapor or whether they're what i'm going to call naked viruses All right when they first get sneezed coughed breathed out of your face uh, they're going to be stuck in the water vapor and then as they move around the space the water vapor is going to evaporate eventually probably depending on the conditions of the space and then you're left with a naked virus, which makes it a lot harder for us to catch. All right, quiz question number one. And just for uh, clarification purposes, if you need PDH hours for Illinois and Wisconsin, you have to answer the quiz questions or you cannot get PDH credits. Uh, so which is the current ASHRAE filtration test standard? By the way, these questions are not hard. These are designed just to make sure that I can prove to someone that you were online and paying attention. Um, so your choices are ASHRAE 52.1, which is the dust spot efficiency, ASHRAE 52.2, which is MERV, or ASHRAE 62.1, which is the indoor air quality standard. Which one of these ASHRAE standards relates to filtration? All right. So in order to answer correctly, you have to answer it on the pop-up poll, not in the question box. Otherwise, it's not going to feed into the grading system. If for some reason you cannot click on the pop-up poll right now, it's probably because you're in full screen view. And there's a quirky thing that goes on with GoToWebinar and GoToMeeting. Uh, if you're in full screen view, you can't answer poll questions for some weird reason. So you just need to hit escape and then you can answer the poll question and hit submit and then you can go back to full screen again. I don't know why it's like that. It's a weird quirk. Uh, but if you're having trouble uh, answering it, uh, that would be the case. So specifically, if your name is Steven Kloss, Answer it on that poll question, please. Not in the question box. Sorry to call you out, Stephen. I just want to make sure you get your credits. All right, I'm going to close this thing. 77% of you answered, so I'm going to close it in like five seconds. Uh, so if you didn't guess, guess something. Just like in high school on the SAT. Three, two, one. I'm closing it. All right, the good news is 83% of you got it correct. Um, the MERV rating standard is what we're looking at currently. Uh, for filtration testing. So that was most of you that got that correct. Let me hide that, go back to our slide deck. All right, so can we catch filters with, with, with can we catch SARS? Can we catch filters? Can we catch SARS-CoV-2 with filters? We can, it's really hard to do, but we can. The biggest challenge is getting the germs back to the filter. Once we get them there, if we got a MERV like 14, 15, we got a pretty good shot at catching it. And then obviously, if you got a HEPA, you got an even better shot at catching it because HEPA on that chart, if you notice, was, was pretty dense, right? I can catch a lot of small stuff with a HEPA. But once again, I still got to get the germ back to the filter in order for the filter to do anything. So second question that comes up a lot. Uh, can I use uh, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation lights uh, to kill COVID? So UVGI, not new at all. This has been around literally since like the 50s we were doing this kind of stuff, 1950s. Uh, you may hear it referred to as UVC because that's the common bandwidth of light, uh, wavelength of light that we're going to use for UVGI. You can use other types of bulbs, UVV, UVC. There's different bulbs you can use for UVGI, but it's usually going to be UVC. So what does UV light in general do? It breaks down the DNA of single cell organisms. Um, the easiest way I can equate it is, is sunlight. Uh, sunlight has UV light associated with it, obviously. You go outside, the sun shines on your skin, it's going to kill some of those skin cells off, right? They're gonna, you're gonna get sunburned, it's gonna die, the skin's gonna flake off, it's gonna fall off your body, right? Any single cell organism can get killed by UV light. So it doesn't care what it is, it's not biased, it kills good things, it kills bad things, it doesn't care. Uh, I often give an example, um, when my wife and I, a long time ago, almost 20 years ago now, 
we're on our honeymoon. Um, we took some catamaran cruise out to some random little island, and the dude that was running the boat takes a stump of a tree on the, on the beach, puts this big bowl of raw fish on, on the stump, and starts walking away. I'm like, hey, dude, what's that all about, man? What's with the raw fish just sitting out there? I'm like, it's like 90 degrees out here. Like, that's that's not right. And he's like, no, no, it's fine. We're going to eat it for lunch. I'm like, yeah, but like, don't we have to like refrigerate it or something, right? He's like, no, it's going to sit out here and the sun's going to cook it. And he squirted some lime juice on it and walked away again. And well, I didn't understand what he was talking about, but now I kind of get it. The UV light from the sun literally kills the germs on top of the fish on all the surface area. Uh, and we ate that fish raw for lunch. No problem. Nobody got sick. All good. It's kind of risky, but... The UV light kills the germs. Same thing's gonna happen in our buildings, in our in our airstreams. The UV light is gonna kill the germs if the UV light can shine on the germs. You gotta get the UV light to the germ. Most of these bulbs are gonna use a 254 nanom nanometer wavelength, which is in the UVC spectrum. And the important thing for our purposes today is how much light do I need to kill something? Specifically today, COVID. Um, I call it the kill dose, that's incorrect because everyone keeps correcting me like, Ryan, you can't really kill a virus because viruses can't live on their own. They can only live with a host. So hence they're not truly living, yada, 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 yada. So you can kill bacteria, you can kill mold, but you can't kill a virus. I guess the proper way I should say it is inactivation dose. But kill just sounds better. So I keep saying that. So this kill dose is a function of the intensity of the source, the UV energy itself, and the amount of time the source is shining on it. There's a unit of measure for that. It's microwatt seconds per centimeter squared. So I can look up in a table, the kill dose for just about any virus and bacteria, see how much I need, and then it's gonna be a function of energy and time to get that dosage. So one of the things to keep in mind is how far the thing is away from the UV source, right? If you're close to the sun, well, if you're really close to the sun, the sun just melts you, right? Vaporizes you instantly. As you get further away from the sun, it takes longer for me to get burned on my skin, right? And if you're on top of a mountain or if you're in a valley, there's a slight difference in how long it'll take for your skin to get burned. Or if you're at the equator versus the Arctic Circle, it could take a, a difference in how long it takes you to get burned. The further you get away, the less intense. If I decide that one inch away from my UV bulb is 100% power, if I get two inches away, I've lost 75% of the power. And when I get just eight inches away, I've lost 92% of the power is gone. That means if I have a germ up here, I don't need a lot of shine time. If I got a germ down here, I need a longer shine time. As I mentioned, you can look this stuff up in the table. Um, this particular table shows a bunch of bacteria on the left, molds and viruses over here on the right. And then there's two columns for each. One is a 90% 90, 90 reduction, which means 10% survival of that germ. The other one's a 99% reduction, which means 1% survival. And you can look and there's different dosages for different kinds of um, um, pathogens. So if I take an example here, I'm going to use its standard UV bulb, a, a fairly good UV bulb for that matter. Um, some of the residential ones are only like around 600, but this one I chose was pretty good. 800 microwatt second, microwatts per centimeter squared at one foot away is what this bulb produces per the manufacturer of that bulb. I'm going to take a specific germ in this case, Bactilius subtilis. I can't even pronounce it, man. Uh, and I want to kill 90% of it. So I need from the table 11,600 is what I need. If I take that intensity bulb, 800, so divide 11,000 by 800, I need 14.5 seconds of shine time at a one foot distance in order to kill this. If I take something else, let's say influenza, and I want to kill 99% of it, I pull that out of the table. Influenza, 99%, I need 6,600. Divided by 800 for the bulb intensity that I have, I need eight seconds of shine time within one foot to kill it. If I'm going to put this in my air handler coil, which is where these bulbs always go, my velocity is around 500 feet per minute because I'm limited or I'll have coil blow off of the water. So that equates to about eight feet per second. So for me to get eight seconds of shine time at one foot distance, I'm going to have to put lights down 66 feet of duct and space them about two feet apart. That's going to be a lot of lights. Probably not going to want to do that, but that's what I'd have to do to kill this guy on one pass. Now, you could argue, well, what if I passed around the air system a second time, right? Okay, great. Now I need 33 feet of light, and I need it two times. What if I pass 10 times? Fine. I need six feet worth of light bulbs, and I need the virus to go around the circle of my airflow path 10 times, right? It starts getting a little bit, a little bit tough. The chance of that virus getting back to the air handler once is really tough, because remember, he's small, doesn't care about airflow. So he's super tiny, isn't gonna happen. So 
So to get it there 10, 12, 15 times, it's not likely to happen. Possible, but not likely. Uh, now, that table I showed you here did not include uh, anything related to COVID, SARS-CoV-2, because this table was made before that. I was able to find some research a couple months ago on uh, the, the survival rates of COVID-19 uh, in microwatt seconds per centimeter squared, which is the dosage I need for this example. Um, but it says predicted because it was early on in the test study, so just keep that in mind. And this is a logarithmic graph. So 10 means 90% survival, 99, 99, or not 90% survival, 90% killed, 99% killed, 99.9% .9 killed. So if I want to get to 99.9% .9 of the elimination of these, meaning only 0.1% survive, I need 2730 as my dosage. If I throw that into my previous formula with my 800 bulb, that comes out to three and a half seconds. So I'm still going to need a pretty good amount of distance of lights uh, bathing that airstream in order for me to get three and a half seconds of shine time moving at 500 feet per minute or eight feet per second. It's pretty fast. So I need a lot of distance and a lot of bulbs to do that. So what does all that mean? It means you're probably not going to kill COVID with a UV light. I get it. We sell UV lights. Lots of people sell UV lights and everyone says it kills COVID and it does. I just need either a lot of lights or a freaky amount of intensity. Instead of an 800 bulb, I need somehow need to get a bulb that's like 8,000 or something, which isn't even available. Um, or I got to rely on the fact that the air moves the germs around multiple times for multiple passes through my air handling system. It's just not likely. But is it true? Will it kill it? Sure. Can I put the UV bulb into space? Sure. That's a thing. You can do that. Um, there's some penalties to doing that. For one, I don't want it shining on people, so I can't put it in an occupied space. That makes it hard. But if you want to put it like in a surgical room, and when the room clears out, you turn the UV lights on? Okay, you could do that. And when the room is being used, you turn them off? Okay, you could do that. There's times you can do it in the space, but most of what you guys are doing is putting it by the evaporator coil, and it just doesn't do much for cleaning the air. It does a great job of cleaning coils, though. UV lights are excellent at cleaning coils because that's what they were designed for. And the main reason is the coil doesn't move. It's stationary. So I have all the time in the world to shine on it. I don't even need a very bright bulb. I just need more time. If I put in a wimpy bulb, 600, fine. I just need a few more minutes than I would with an 800 bulb because uh, the coil's not going to move and go anywhere. So keeping coils clean, that's their primary job in life. If you keep the coil clean, it does both a better job of heat transfer. BTUs can move through the metal better than they can move through the metal plus the dirt or the metal plus the growth of whatever's on there. And they also do better on the airflow side. The less crap built up on the coil and less stuff growing on the coil, the more airflow will be able to flow through it. So there are a lot of benefits to putting a UV light on the coil, but keeping air in a room clean is not one of those benefits. Now, you can say it keeps the air in the room clean because stuff's not flaking off the coil and ending up in the airflow because the stuff is dead, um, but it's not going to kill germs that are already in the room. So it's good at cleaning the coil, not good at cleaning air in a room. Uh, Lewis asks, what about having the UV light on the return side by the filter and have it shine on the filter? as any particles sit on the filter. Of course, it gets caught on the filter. So he's saying put the UV light by the filter instead of the coil. So two things with that. One, I'm still relying on the germs getting to the filter. And if the germs are small, like a virus, they don't care about airflow, so they're not gonna get entrained in the return air. So I'm not gonna get the germ to the filter or the light, so it doesn't much matter. Two, if I'm only gonna buy one light, I'd rather have it on the coil, because keeping the coil clean is harder than keeping the filter clean. I could take the filter out and throw it away and get a new one. I'm not going to do that with the coil. So if you're only buying one bulb, I'd shine it on the coil, not on the filter. If you want to buy two, great, shine it on both. No problem with that, other than, you know, more, more things to buy. Um, with that being said, don't put it on the return duct of the air handler until after the return. So don't put it on the, okay, let me say it this way. Don't ever put it on the return of the air handler. You could put it in the mixed air section of the air handler by the filter, but don't put it further upstream at the return. Because then when you're in economizer mode, all of your return air goes out the exhaust of the system, out the exhaust of the air handler, because you have 100% outside air or a very large portion of outside air coming in. So I'm then using a UV light to try to kill stuff in the air, which doesn't work very well anyway, and all that air is leaving out the exhaust. So make sure you wait till after the exhaust and outside air mix, then have your bulb and then your filter. But once again, I don't think it matters. If you can't get the germ back to the filter and the bulb, what's the difference? All right, quiz question number two. Uh, I missed Nick's question. Nick said, so UV lights are a scam at this point. Good to know. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to say they're a scam. 
they're good for what they were intended for originally, which is cleaning coils. Uh, if you want to use them for more than that, it's pretty difficult. All right, which are HVAC mounted UVC lights uh, most effective at cleaning? We just mentioned this. So once again, this is not a hard question. I literally just said it. Um, so it should be easy for everybody to get this right. Uh, Frey asks, what's good for commercial applications and 30 foot ceilings? Uh, I'm saying I'm assuming you're wanting to put a UV light in it in the ceiling. I would not be putting the UV bulbs in the ceiling space at all because then they're shining down on people and that could be a problem. Now there are ones that shine upward only. And they reflect all the light up to the ceiling. Um, but I'm concerned about the germs down here. So shining up at the ceiling only kills what happens to be floating around the ceiling. Is it better than nothing? Sure. Um, but it's probably not even better than putting it at the coil. Um, okay. 81% of you answered. I'm going to give it five seconds and I'm going to close this quiz. Three, two, one. And 95% of you got it correct. Um, it's best for using to clean the coil surface area. All right, moving along. All right, what about humidity? What can that do for us and COVID? I'm sure you've all seen this chart, if not in the ASHRAE handbook, uh, in other places, and you may have seen more pretty versions of it. This chart's been around for, I don't know, 30 some years. Um, and the basic gist of this chart is that certain viruses and bacteria thrive when it's dry and other bad things, right? Uh, asthma and dust and electrical shock and all those things and other stuff, other bacteria and viruses and fungus slash mold thrives when it's really humid in a space. And if I can keep stuff between 30 and 60% or some newer versions of this chart will say between 40 and 60%, it's kind of the sweet area. Uh, less bad things will be able to happen. So kind of like the middle target is 50%. And if you look at any like your HVAC design manuals, most of them are suggesting that you design the space for 75 degrees cooling, 50% RH. It's a very common design point. Um, but anyway, we're going to try to keep things between, say, 40 and 60% uh, to minimize some of these bad things. I've got a few other ones I want to show you here that relate to that. Unfortunately, these were all ones I stolen from somebody in England. Um, I shouldn't say stole. I borrowed maybe uh so everything's in celsius so i have to like uh kind of like think about that a little bit here but the humidity is relative so it doesn't matter so 20 degrees celsius is pretty cold like 60 some degrees right so it's a 68 degrees i think maybe something like that uh what would it be 25 degrees would be 77 fahrenheit so something like that 68 70 degrees so like a kind of like a room temp type thing um the black line is 20 percent relative humidity and how many days in this case, human coronavirus will survive. So this is not the COVID-2 version of it. Um, I'm getting some data on that. This is just the regular SARS version. It seems weird that we actually have a regular and we have a two, which is, I don't know, odd. But the idea here is to show you that viruses in general, especially ones that are coronaviruses, the drier the space is, the longer this stuff is gonna be able to survive. And then down the vertical axis is showing you the survival rate. Uh, so when I get down to here, that means 10% survival, 90% dead. So if I have 20% relative humidity, it's going to take me two weeks to use humidity alone to get rid of um, all the coronavirus that might be propagating in there. It's a very long time. If I have something that's uh, more humid, 80%, it still has a pretty, that's, that's the green line. It still has a pretty long survival rate. But if I get more to that sweet spot, once again, 40, 50, 60%, this blue line is 50%. Humidity alone can wipe out a fairly substantial, let's say 99.9% .9 in like three days. If I'm only concerned with say 99%, maybe it's two days. Uh, so humidity can play a role in here. It's not the only thing I need to do, right? Filtration is part of it. Maybe UV is part of it, maybe. Humidity is part of it. Um, temperature is actually part of it. So this is that same study but this is overlaying with temperatures. So this one, I went ahead and put Fahrenheit on here because I couldn't stand to look at the Celsius numbers anymore. It's driving me crazy. Uh, no offense to everybody who look, works in academia and works with Celsius. Uh, so the black line is pretty cold, 40 degrees. The red line is pretty hot, 100 degrees.
the blue line in the middle is something more like a winter room temperature of 68 degrees. So you can see what happens here on that survival rate chart. Once I get down to say, we call it 40%, basically 38%, 40%, I've got 99% of those guys no longer being able to survive very well. But then if I get back up, if I go back up above 60%, it starts thriving again. So between 40 and 60% is where I have a dip in this curve. And had we overlaid more uh, temperatures on here, they'd all have a little dip on there and it gets flatter and flatter as we go. And then when it's hot enough, then it doesn't even matter then at that point for humidity. Um, but from normal room spaces, 40 to 60% is kind of my goal. So that means I might want to start humidifying some buildings that I normally didn't humidify. We do pretty good as an industry humidifying homes, but we don't really do good in other spaces. And on the flip side, and I know this is weird because we're now in November, but there's some spaces that have high indoor humidity that I need to deal with. Um, so like fitness centers and things like that, school gymnasiums, I'm going to have to do something a little bit different to keep the high humidity down in check. Because even though we'd like to think we designed the space for 50%, there's a lot of people, not you guys, but other people, that oversize equipment, which makes it difficult to control humidity. So there's lots of stuff we can do to control humidity on the dehumidification side. On the humidification side, it's pretty much a humidifier. All right, quiz question number three. Oh, dude. Killing me, Smalls. Holger, man, what's wrong with you? I didn't take the thing down. Dang it. All right, let me real quick. I'll just show you. I won't repeat them, but I'll just show you what those two charts look like. Uh, that was the Sterling chart I was talking about where... Everything bad happens below 30 or 40% humidity and other bad, bad bad things happen above 60. This is out of the ASHRAE handbook. So 40 to 60 is a sweet spot. That was a chart I was talking about where we're looking at different temperatures um, or excuse me, different humidities. Black was 20% dry, uh, green was 80% humid and blue was 50% neutral uh, and how long coronavirus would survive. And this is the last one I was just talking about. I'm sorry, guys, it was my fault. Last one I was just talking about where uh, for normal type of room temperature in the winter, 40 to 60% is a pretty good, pretty good range for coronaviruses. All right, I'm sorry about that. That was, that was totally me. And like three or four of you typed something in and I didn't even look at it until like three minutes later. Let me see if I missed anything. Let me launch this quiz question. Um, all right, this will be harder because I just blew through the slides on you guys, but true or false? Maintaining indoor space temps between 55 and 75% relative humidity minimizes bacteria, viruses, and mold. Let me see if I missed anything else from you guys other than you all saying that I'm an idiot, which is fair. Well, like 80 people said that. Uh, Marcin asks, can there be two UV lights, one on the plenum duct and two on the return? You could. Once again, I don't think there's any benefit of putting a UV light on the return at all. Um, I would only put it at the coil, but put it, you could put it as many as you want on there. And in fact, sometimes like residentially, they sell two bulb setups where one bulb goes on top of the A coil and one bulb, go, one bulb goes underneath the A coil. Uh, commercially, it's going to require you to have five, six, seven, eight, ten bulbs on there to cover the whole entire evaporator coil. So the chance you want to put a bunch of bulbs on the evaporator coil and then repeat that with a bunch of bulbs on the return of a large commercial air handler. I don't think anybody wants 10, 12 bulbs to have to deal with, um, but you could theoretically do that. Um, all these other ones are not being able to see the chart, not see the chart, not see the chart. Yeah, I'm an idiot. All right, I skipped those 75 comments about the chart. I think we're good. All right, I'm closing this poll. The correct answer is in fact false. That sweet spot is 40 to 60%. You definitely do not want to be between 55 and 75. In fact, ASHRAE standards don't even want you above 60. Uh, mold growth and bad things happen on there. So 75 is way too high. So slight, I'm not going to say it's a hard question, but slightly, wait a minute, hang on, hang on. I need to hide this. Otherwise, you guys are going to just see this all day long. I almost did it again, man. Okay, moving on with hopefully the correct slides. All right, so filters, yes, if I get the germ to the filter. UV light, yes, if I get the germ to the UV light. Humidity, yes, some help. It's not gonna be able to do it all on its own, but it will definitely help. What about fresh air? And hence the ERV discussion that we've been talking about with the people's gas folks a lot lately. All right, 
you probably have seen this article uh, in numerous publications, uh, and it pretty much showed up on social media everywhere saying that uh, HVAC or air conditioning specifically spreads COVID-19. You probably all saw that. All your friends and family sent it to you because you're the only HVAC guy or gal they know. So they sent it to you and said, what the hell is this? And you said, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so what's the real deal behind this? Um, maybe you've already seen some of the answers to this or the details, but I'm just going to use this one slide from one of the ashtray presentations uh, to kind of illustrate what was going on here. So this is that restaurant in China that all those articles were referencing. Uh, and it shows the layout. This top area of the seating area over here is where one person came into the place that had COVID-19. All the people in red are the ones that end up contracting it while they were there. And all the people in yellow did not. So no surprise, the people sitting closer got it. People that weren't didn't. Um, but the people that were sitting over here, they primarily got it because of the air distribution system. So yeah, I guess you could blame the air conditioning. It sucked the return air in, which included some of the viruses and blew it back across, right? Now we can go back to the argument like, well, how many of the viruses did it really suck in? How much did it really blow around, right? But it does move some of them. Air will move some of the viruses, even though it doesn't do it very well. But if you sit there for an hour, eventually enough of them are gonna move around that some of the people are gonna contract it and others might not. And if you sat there even longer, they all would get it eventually. But here's the other reason why they got it. If you can tell by this picture, these are all ductless mini splits in here. Ductless mini splits are fantastic for like dehumidification control and tight temperature control um, and ease of installation. But what they're not good at is fresh air. And unfortunately, this facility didn't have much fresh air. One liter per second, which is 2.1 CFM per person. There is nowhere in our whole country that has a rate that low. Wisconsin is the lowest outside air requirement of all the states that I'm aware of, and their requirement is seven and a half CFM per person. Most places, uh, by the way, Wisconsin is the lowest, city of Chicago is the highest, and everywhere else in the country is somewhere in between. So like the city of Chicago suburbs, for a restaurant, I believe it's seven and a half CFM per person plus 0 0.06 CFM per square foot, I think is what it is. An office building would be five CFM per person plus 0 0.06 CFM per square foot. This place just had two CFM per person and that was it. No square foot, not even the right per person. So the fact that they had no ventilation air is a large contributing factor. And all of the ASHRAE articles since then reference that specific issue. So yeah, you could say the HVAC spread it or the fact that it was poorly designed HVAC is what helped it spread. Uh, people need ventilation. Um, there's lots of reasons why we want ventilation. We don't have time today to go through every single thing, but generally speaking, the indoor air that you breathe is significantly worse than the outdoor air you breathe. Now, if you live next to some kind of oil fired pile plant or something like that, okay, that's different. But for most people, the outdoor air is significantly cleaner than the indoor air. In the indoor air, you have VOCs being, being given off of your paint and carpeting and furnishings. You have your cubicle mate coughing all over the place. You have the weird cologne of somebody else that just walked by. There's all kinds of things going on uh, in a building and it's all trapped in the building. We want it to get out of the building, right? If we can't catch everything or kill everything, we want it to get out of the building and let it do something outside and get diluted down. So that means I need to bring fresh air in. I gotta either suck air out and let fresh air leak in or I gotta bring fresh air in to force the dirty air out or both of those things. But I have to get the fresh air into the space. There's nowhere that I'm aware of in the country that doesn't have requirements for ventilation for occupied commercial buildings. Um, there are other reasons why we need air coming into a building. And I don't want you to confuse combustion air with the fresh air we're talking about today. Your combustion appliances, whether it's a house or whether it's a uh, office building or a, or a restaurant, all those appliances, they need combustion air for them. The air I'm talking about right now is above and beyond that. I need fresh air for the occupants in addition to all the CFM I need for the combustion. So whatever the, the whatever this boiler has for exhaust, let's just say it's exhausting 300 CFM, somewhere 300 CFM has to come in to make up the 300 going out. So I gotta have all this combustion air coming in. There's places that I wanna have direct exhaust as well. And I have to make up all of these things with my makeup air. And then unrelated to, and in addition to all the makeup air for these, I need fresh air for the occupants. It's a lot of air we're talking about. How much air do I need? Well, if we ignore Wisconsin, seven and a half CFM per person, no matter what, and we ignore city of Chicago, which dictates to you the supply air CFM, and then one third of that comes from outdoors. Everywhere else, so 
suburbs, uh, Minnesota, Indiana, everywhere else is going to have something that's a derivative of ASHRAE 62, uh, like the International Mechanical Code is a derivative of ASHRAE 62. You look up in a table how much outside air you need. This is kind of the historical rates for office buildings over time. Ignore the giant pyramid because you're not going to work on any buildings that have not been updated since 1922, hopefully. So 10 CFM per person was a pretty common requirement. After the energy embargo crisis, we went to 5 CFM per person at ASHRAE. That didn't work out so well. Lots of people were getting sick at buildings. So we got rid of that quickly. And then ASHRAE kind of overreacted the other way and tripled the rate to 15 CFM. Eventually, when I started in the 90s, we were up towards 20 CFM per person. And now we're at approximately 17 and a half CFM per person for an office building. I say approximately because starting in 2004, it ceased to be a per person number and became a per person plus a per square foot number. So now when you look it up, this is one of like four or five pages in the uh, ASHRAE handbook. Uh, when you look it up, ignore the liters per second. I don't care about that. Look at the CFM. So I need to take the CFM per person and the CFM per square foot and add the two of them together. So if I look at the office building example we were just talking about, it's five CFM per person plus 0 0.06 CFM per square foot. And for an average density of space, that's around 17. Now, if you have more or less cubicles in the room, that number would be different over here for the 17. But the five per person and the 0 0.06 per square foot are what you're looking at from a code requirement. The reason that it split was to make demand control ventilation easier. Uh, so we can modulate the people portion we can't modulate the building portion because the building portion is caused by VOCs and furnishings and carpeting and all that stuff. The per person portion is the amount of people coming in and out of the building and that we can track with CO2 and decide if we want to modulate that por portion or not. Um, some buildings will require more, like we just looked at an office building. But if I look at uh, a classroom, it's literally double. Instead of five, it's 10 per person. Instead of 0 0.06, it's 0 0.12 per person. A classroom requires double the amount of ventilation air as opposed to an office building with the same amount of people and square footage. All right, so where's the ERV come into discussion? ERV, if you didn't know, stands for Energy Recovery Ventilator. First thing I always ask is how much outside air was required. So basically, what did this table tell you to do? If that table told you that your building needs, needs 100 CFM, this is not an interesting project for an ERV. 100 CFM is statistically zero. It's basically nothing. You have an unoccupied building with one person in it, right? Who cares? The more outside air you have, the more interesting it gets. And the reason is, for an ERV, generally speaking, all the control widgets and the labor to install it and all that stuff is pretty pretty fixed to, for the size, right? For the, but the more CFM I have, the more energy I can recover. So having an ERV that's doing 2,000 CFM versus when it's 200 CFM, it gets more interesting on a per CFM basis, financially speaking. So lots of outside air is the target for this kind of stuff. Second question is how much exhaust air do you have? Because I'm going to recover air, or not air, I'm going to recover energy out of the exhaust air and give that energy to the outside air. Well, if you don't have hardly any exhaust, who cares that there's a lot of outside air? You don't have any exhaust to get energy from. So what's the difference? Or vice versa. Great, you got a lot of exhaust where you're wasting all this heat. Well, I can't grab the heat and send it to the outside air because I don't have any outside air. So I need a lot of both for this to start making sense. I also need to get the airstreams close to each other. In this example over here, there's a rooftop with an outside air intake on one side of the building. The other side of the building has an exhaust fan exhausting out. That's gonna be a difficult one to do an ERV on. I need those things close to each other, right next to each other, uh, preferably, and that makes it significantly easier to do. So what does this kind of look like? So let's look at a winter example in the bottom right first. There's four airstreams on every ERV. In this example, I'm showing a wheel style. There are other styles as well. We'll talk about those in a minute. But I have this ERV wheel in this case. I have seven degree air coming in from outdoors and I'm gonna bring that into my air handling system and heat it and cool it and filter it and make it all wonderful for everybody. Somewhere else, I have exhaust air leaving the building because whatever's coming in, somewhere it's gotta be going out. And if I can bring that out through a controlled exit like I am right here on an exhaust system, I can have that energy going out, in this case, 72 degree air. And instead of me just taking that and dumping it away, what if I transfer the BTUs to the outside air? Not the air molecules. The air molecules go straight on through and exit, but the BTUs get loaded up on this heat exchanger. This heat exchanger spins into the other airstream, and then the cold seven degree air gets warmed up with free heat up to 53 degrees in this example. Additionally, if it's an enthalpy recovery uh, type uh, ERV, it's gonna also do latent energy. 
So I had 54 wet bulb that was going to exit and I spin that to the other airstream and my six degree wet bulb coming in turned into 40. So I came in at six wet, seven dry, and I exited the wheel at 40 wet, 53 dry bulb. And then that went into my air handler to be further heated and cooled as needed. But that's starting out. My, I'm, my air handler, my cooling coil, or in this case, probably my heating coil, doesn't know it's a seven degree day outside. It thinks it's 53 out. It's getting 40 some degrees of free heat to start off with. On the left side is a summer scenario, works exactly the same way. But in this case, instead of me transferring heat from this exhaust stream to the outside air, I'm gonna transfer heat from the outside air to the exhaust air. So I have 95 degree air coming in with a pretty nasty wet bulb of 78 wet bulb. And I'm gonna send those sensible latent BTUs on the heat exchanger to the other airstream where they will get exhausted out by this air moving through here. And then my 95 degrees gets free cooled down to 81 and my 78 gets free dehumidified down to 68. So on a 95, 78 day, my evaporator coil is gonna think it's 81, 68 coming in. Um, Mark asked, what point are you concerned about frosting? Uh, I am trying to remember if I in fact have those slides in here. If not, we can address it separately. I don't have the frost slides in here. So I will give you a reference to look that up and we can deal with that. Oops. Um, but the frosting function is basically I plotted out on a psychometric chart. Um, and you take, well, now that I started saying it, now I have to show it. Otherwise, it's not going to work because my ability to describe something verbally is zero. So let me go to a much longer two hour ERV presentation and just pull up that one slide. Um, frosting. And what's the fastest way for me to find frosting? There, this, will, this one will work. All right, so on a psychometric chart, what I would do is I would plot my outdoor condition, in this case, negative five degree day. I plot my indoor return air condition, 75 degrees at 45% RH in this case. And then I draw a straight line between those two things. And if and when they cross the saturation line, the 100% humidity curve, that's when condensation will occur. And if that condensation is below 32, it is going to frost and it's going to be a problem. So if I don't want that to be a problem, I have numerous different choices. But essentially, my choices come down to I either need to warm up this air. And let's say I warm it up 10 degrees, the outside incoming air from negative five to positive five. And then if I redrew the line, it probably wouldn't hit the 100% saturation curve. So I either, either need to warm up the outside air or, believe it or not, warm up the exhaust air that's leaving. And that's actually the better way to do it. I'm going to warm up to 75. If I warm it up to like 85 and then redraw the line, I also will not hit the curve. Now, it seems stupid to warm up the exhaust air that you're going to throw away. Like, why the hell would you do that, Ryan? Um, if I have a better drawing on that, I'll just use this example. Why would you warm up this return air that's gonna leave? Well, if I warm up the outside air coming in upstream of this wheel, and this wheel is a 70% effective wheel, that means 70% of the BTUs are gonna go that way and leave the building, and only 30% go into the space. It thawed the wheel, sure, but only 30% of the BTUs went into my space. If I heat this return air, It'll also thaw the wheel, but 30% is going to leave and 70% is going to come back around. So don't ever put the heater on the ventilation inlet side. Put the heater on the return air exiting side upstream of the wheel. It's, it's hokey. I get it. Um, but we do a lot of them that way. In fact, we almost do all of them that way now. Unless somebody's stubborn. Uh, benefits of the ERV, better dehumidification control, better humidification control, right? I was getting free humidity in the winter, free dehumidification in the summer, reduce my peak loads, reduce my energy consumption, buy a smaller chiller, buy a smaller condensing unit, buy a smaller gas heater, buy a smaller boiler. It's taking care of a lot of stuff for me. Paybacks can be pretty quick. This chart is specific to rooftop replacements. Uh, other scenarios would be a little bit different, but this gives you a general idea. If I take an example here with 1500 CFM of outside air, uh, and I picked a specific wheel model number in this case, it is reducing my cooling needs by four tons. If I was in the market to get an 18 ton rooftop unit, I am now in the market for a 14 ton rooftop unit because four tons is getting done for me before it even gets there. And I'm gonna look for something with 120,000 BTUs less of heat. Coming off the wheel, this was done for a uh, 95 degree summer day, 95, 76, I think it was and then a minus 10 winter day. 
But 95 degree day, I'm gonna get 80, 67 off the wheel. On a negative 10 degree day, I'm getting 50 off the wheel, 60 degrees of heat. 80, 67 is not random. Uh, we usually size a lot of ERVs for 80, 67. You can get ones that'll do better or worse. Um, better ones cost more, worse ones cost less. But we target 80, 67 typically because that is the AHRI rating point for everybody's evaporator coil. It's expecting 8067 on the inlet of the evaporator anyway. So if I can get there with the outside air, with the ERV, it's like you don't even have outside air from the perspective of the evaporator coil. This one had a pretty fast payback, a year and a half. Uh, if I take another example, 12,000 CFM, that's a pretty big unit. Uh, it's gonna reduce my tonnage by 30 tons, almost a million BTUs less of heating, and my payback in that example was 0.1 years. That's basically a month. I picked that one because it's obviously the best one on the slide. Uh, and in all fairness, the reason that happened is because dropping it 30 tons got me out of like semi-custom land on the rooftop units down into the smaller tonnages where it's pretty much commodity land. Um, and that's a big difference in the cost. So that, that really drove the payback on that. So that's kind of a unique situation. Uh, but you can see, once you get above 1,000 or 1,500 CFM, the paybacks start getting nice. When you get small stuff, three, four, five, six hundred CFM, the paybacks are kind of long because uh, you're buying all the same electronics and it's all the same amount of effort. It's just you don't have enough outside air to deal with it to, to recover from. Um, so different types of ERVs. I mentioned wheels. There's also fixed plates. Um, I don't know if you've seen those. Two plates crisscross each other and we exchange heat that way. There's heat pipes, uh, runaround coils. Uh, there's different styles out there. Heat pipes and runaround coils uh, they're not going to help us comply with the code requirements because they can't do latent recovery. Wheels and cores can be done in a latent or non-latent version. You would need the latent version, the enthopalic core, enthopalic wheel, in order to be able to comply with code. So there are two types. There's HRV and, H and ERV. HRV is heat recovery ventilator, sensible only energy, no latent. Latent's not my problem. I don't do moisture. Then there's ERV, enthalpy recovery ventilator. I do sensible plus latent energy. Um, so obviously I want to do both when I can. There are some projects where you're going to want to do the HRV. Those projects are ones where the indoor humidity is regularly worse than the outdoor humidity. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're doing a locker room at a, at a fitness center, you're generating a lot of water with those showers. I don't want to recover that moisture, certainly not in the summer and not even in the winter in that case. I want it all to go away. So I'm going to do an HRV in those kind of applications. Um, if I had some kind of, I don't know, giant water fountain Bellagio style thing in a lobby, maybe then I would want to do an HRV. But 99% of your projects, it's going to be an ERV. I want to save the moisture in the winter. I want to get rid of the moisture in the summer. Uh, Asteroid 62 is a driving factor. It dictates our ventilation rates, as we mentioned. Asteroid 90.1 is the other driving factor behind ERVs. In many cases, they are code required on newer systems. When are they code required? Well, it used to be not very often. Stuff that had 70% outside air on 5,000 CFM systems. So not a lot of stuff. But since 2010, ASHRAE, and which is 2012 uh, energy code, uh, there are new rules. And one of those rules is you have to be 50% enthalpy recovery, meaning you can't do just sensible. You have to do sensible plus latent if you want to get 50% of the total. The other big requirement in that regard is that we no longer look at 70% as the threshold. We get tables based on your geographic region. Most of you guys are in Chicago or Wisconsin. So Chicago is climate zone 5A, Wisconsin is 6A. You probably already knew that. When I go look at the tables, there are now two tables. There's the regular table on top, and then the bottom table is for 24 seven operation. So if it's a regular building where I don't operate all the time, and I look at climate zone 5A or 6A, where most of you are at, this is my threshold. So instead of 70%, 5,000 CFM on the supply, if my supply is 1,000 with 70% outside air, I need an ERV. And then it tears down from there, all the way down to 10% outside air on a what is a fairly large 26,000 CFM system. So either a lot of outside air, or excuse me, a lot of supply air, uh, hence a lot of outside air, um, or not a lot of supply air, but a high fraction of outside air. There's probably better ways they could have made this table, but this is how they decided to do it. If you're operating 24 seven or almost 24 seven, 24 seven would be 8,760 hours. So if you're operating 8,000 hours a year or more, essentially 24 seven, then pretty much every project you do would have to have an ERV unless it's less than 10% outside air. So if you're doing hospitals and stuff like that, you're probably thinking you got to go with an ERV. Um, maybe a, a, an all-night pharmacy might have to do it, right? There's, there's a lot of thresholds on when this is going to kick in because of this table now. 
The best candidates are ones that have a lot of outside air. Who's that? Offices, schools, theaters, fitness centers. These all have something in common, which is typically a lot of people in a relatively tight density. So those are the kind of places where I'm going to be looking at putting an ERV in. It helps out with the humidity. If I can pre-humidify or pre-dehumidify the air, that's going to help us with the same discussion we just had uh, about not having things too dry or too moist on that sterling chart. Keep things in that 30 to 60, 40 to 60 type range. How might that help? Well, if I have a standard package unit designed for maximum occupancy, obviously, designed for a hot day, obviously. In this case, it's 15,000 CFM. I selected my coil for a 53 degree dew point. My thermostat's for 75 degrees in this space. That results in a 48% relative humidity. Everything's wonderful. But if it's not fully occupied or it's not a design day outside and I still move the 15,000 CFM, it's going to cause me to have to cycle this unit to maintain the 75 on, off, on, off. We're over here. It was running constant. So that means I'm going to be getting a dew point of 70 something, 50 something, 70 something, 50 something, 70 something, 50 something. And it's going to average out to 65.5. And that's going to be pretty difficult to dehumidify with. And hence, I'm going to have a resultant humidity that's 71% in this space. Both spaces get 75 degrees because that's what they set the thermostat for. One of them just has a lot more humidity because it can't handle the part load condition very well. There's lots of ways to deal with that. Modulating chilled water valves, slowing blowers down, all kinds of things we can do there. Uh, humidimizer, hot gas reheat, lots of options. One of those options is the ERV, especially if my humidity problem is coming from the outdoors. If it's mostly indoors, right, it's a... It's a gym where people are working out like, like madmen and sweating it up. Well, then the ERV is not going to help me as much as it as maybe one of the other methods would uh, with modulating chilled water or something like that. But if my outside air humidity is the problem, think of it like this. This is my psych chart. My normal air handler or rooftop has to handle this really cold day over here, my really hot day, my really humid day, my really dry day. It's got to cover everything and it doesn't do it very well. If the ERV preheats the air from the red to the blue, pre-cools it from red to blue, pre-dehumidifies it from red to blue, pre-humidifies it from red to blue. Now my air handler only has to deal with the blue blob instead of the red blob. And that's going to mean that it's not going to be incorrectly sized as much or at all. Uh, it's going to be right in the sweet spot. It's going to be very easy for me to dehumidify this space with my air handling system um, because I don't have to deal with the outside air. It's handled by the ERV. Uh, I mentioned runaround systems. Um, these are only sensible. You can't do any latent, so you're not going to use these for code compliance, but you may use them in a manufacturing facility or something like that. Basically, you throw an extra hydronic coil on your ventilation air coming in. You throw an extra hydronic coil on your exhaust air going out, and you pump water between the two. So if it's hot air leaving, you pump the water, you get the warm water back, and use it to preheat your outside air. Or if it's the opposite season, opposite scenario. right? And this works well when the exhaust air and supply air are far apart from each other but you don't do any latent energy. Heat pipes also don't do any latent energy. They are essentially the exact same thing as these runaround coils, except instead of water, there's refrigerant in there. And the pipes have to be really close to each other. There's no compression cycle. It's just refrigerant in pipes. Each pipe is individual all on its own. Every one of these pipes has its own little refrigeration cycle, if you will, um, but no compressors on there. So I can't get to low temps, hence I can't dehumidify anything. But I can move BTUs from left to right or right to left. Sensible only, not good for code compliancy. Uh, fixed plates, I can get metal plates that do only sensible, or I can get ones that have a fibrous material in them where I can do sensible and latent transfer. So the way that would look, I have two airstreams. I crisscross them. This return air going through goes through the heat exchanger this way. The outside air coming in goes through the heat exchanger that way. Those two airstreams don't touch each other. They go through sleeves, if you will, through pockets on the heat exchanger. Just like if you had an evaporator coil, that's a heat exchanger. I got refrigerant on one scenario, air on the other, right? They don't ever touch each other. Or you have a gas-fired furnace. I have two air streams in that case. One is the combustion slash exhaust air. One is the building air. And those air streams never touch each other. The same thing's happening here. I have a heat exchanger with two air streams crisscrossing, and I'm transferring BTUs from one to the other. If I get the enthalpy version... There's a, I always call it paper, but they yell at me, a fibrous material in there that wicks the moisture through. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this as, as a kid, but we used to do it in, in school. We take two glasses of water, put blue food coloring in one, no food coloring in the other, put a string between the two, go to lunch, come back, 
And instead of blue and clear, we had two baby blues. The vapor pressure would wick the moisture up through the string and the two water streams would be mixing in that regard. That's exactly what will happen on this material. It'll pull that moisture through. And then we have the wheel, which I mentioned previously. Um, and unlike the other ones where the air streams are going through fixed media, in this case, the heat exchanger rotates between the two air streams. So in this example, maybe the bottom gets warmed up and it rotates to the top where it releases its heat, turns back around, gets warmed up, rotates to the top, releases its heat. Um, so those guys are spinning. So there's one extra thing involved here. It's got a small motor on there, typically like an eighth horsepower or even smaller sometimes. It doesn't have to do a lot of work. It's just turning this wheel at fairly low revolutions. This is basically like a record player. If you had an old 45 record, that's what, well, nobody knows what I'm even talking about. If you're old enough to know what a 45 record is, thank you. Um, it's rotating at like that type of speed, like 30, 40, 50 revolutions per minute. Coming around here. It can't go too fast because then I won't be able to transfer the BTUs quick enough. And it can't go too slow because then it's not going to do it either. It's got to be kind of just enough time for the BTUs to get inside this heat exchanger and then move to the other airstream. Um, you can do some stuff with frost control by changing the wheel speed. Um, on simple ERVs, you won't do that, but on more complex air handlers, you would. And this can also be a sensible only or a sensible plus latent version. Most of them are latent. The way these guys do the latent is the plastic media of the wheel is impregnated with a silica gel. That's like, um, you know, those little packets of stuff you get like in your leather shoe box or in your electronics boxes. It says silica gel, do not eat. It's that stuff. That's in the box to absorb moisture and release moisture to keep the shoe box neutral when it gets shipped all over the place. That same material is on this media and it'll absorb moisture in this airstream and rotate to the other airstream that's drier and release it. And it always goes from the moist to the dry airstream. And that changes with the season, which airstream is which, but the way it works doesn't change. You can do a significantly larger amount of BTUs in a given amount of space uh, with a wheel versus the other technologies with the, with the fixed plates. But sometimes you can't use the wheel. Because this wheel is in motion, there are some places from a code perspective that that's not gonna be allowed. So sometimes like somewhere regulated by IDPH, which has a different annotation to it nowadays than it would normally, but I'm talking about like Department of Health facilities, like hospitals, those kind of places, or toilet exhaust in the city of Chicago, and only in the city of Chicago, everywhere else in the world it's fine, but in the city of Chicago, toilet exhaust cannot go through a rotating media. Um, so in those kind of applications, you will have to use a fixed core. But if you have the choice, and we do both, so I'm not biased or anything, we do both. Uh, if you have the choice, use a wheel style, because you'll be able to do more CFM in a smaller uh, air handler space, or, or excuse me, more BTUs with a smaller air handler space. The way you connect these to the, to the air handling system, I'm way behind, I gotta power through here. You can either directly duct it into the space, that's a problem because you're dumping semi-conditioned air on people instead of fully conditioned air. You instead could duct it into the fan coils. These could be ductless mini splits, they could be fan coils, they could be air handlers, it could be a one-to-one -one relationship, it could be a one-to-five relationship. You duct it into the air handler, mix it with the return, finish heating or cooling it, and then send it into the space. You can have it inside the main air handler, like on a VAV system or something like that, you can have a wheel or a core inside there doing his thing, in which case these two airstreams have to crisscross. Um, you can also use it for certain applications where you might want some free reheat. So in this case, we have two cores. It could be wheels, but this one's cores. Um, the return air is coming in, releasing its energy and going out the exhaust. The fresh air comes in, gets the free energy, then comes around and goes through another core where it releases more energy goes through a cooling coil to get cooled way down below the dew point and pull a lot of moisture out of there. And then it wraps around and it picks up the heat it just left off. So he drops off some heat, gets cooled really low. And then instead of reheating with electric heat or a hydronic coil and paying the heat, I'm gonna free reheat um, off of my own energy, which is kind of sweet. Uh, there's all kinds of different examples and we can do stuff like that. You can get ERVs that are built into packaged outdoor units. This is fairly common now. These get paired up with VRF systems very frequently. Uh, if you need fresh air to come in some way. Uh, so that's an option as well. Uh, you could take a standard rooftop and an ERV and duct them together on the roof. You could take a standard rooftop and an ERV and duct them together under the roof. You can get a combination curb. So you got one curb where a rooftop and ERV both sit on top of it and the ducting is in between them. Uh, in the side of the curb, that's another way to do it. Uh, it's kind of ugly, but it's on a roof, so who cares? Here's your standard rooftop, here's your combo curb, here's your ERV. Fresh air on this guy gets sucked in, 
goes through one side of the ERV or through the curb and goes into the unit as if it was the return. The return comes up and doesn't go into the unit. It goes down the other side of the curb and goes out as the exhaust. And my ERV exchange is over here. The nice thing about this is I still have the economizer available for an economizer day. I can shut the ERV off and economize when I want to do free cooling. And there's also little small ones you can bolt onto the side of a package rooftop unit. So lots of different ways to get that done. Um, but you gotta have a lot of outside air, you gotta have a lot of exhaust air, and they have to be near each other for any of this to start working. In regards to ERV specifically, uh, we have a full recorded webinar, like an hour and a half version. If you wanna dive deeper into just ERVs, uh, we have that. Um, it's available on our website. I can send you the link if you want it. All right, last two quiz questions. Let's throw these up so you guys can uh, not be mad at me for going over. Not be mad at me too much. Number four, which is not an IAQ benefit of an ERV. Uh, fresh air for space dilution, lower energy cost, improved humidity control, which is not an IAQ benefit. Let me see if I missed anything. All right, I'm gonna close this thing down. Looks like most people have answered. All right, and the correct answer is energy costs. There's no air quality, indoor air quality benefit for lower energy costs. It does do that, um, but there's no benefit to that. All right, so real quick, last three or four slides, what else can you do? Uh, and these all require their own 30 minute explanation and we have tons of recorded videos and webinars and everything on these if you wanna know about them. But one of the things that I like to talk about is the ability to do something in the space. Filter has to wait for something bad to get to it. UV bulb has to wait for something bad to get to it. Fresh air does help in the space, as does humidity, but they're only part of the story. So there are things we can do in the case of photocatalytic oxidation, send oxidizers in the space to kill and attack germs. Bipolar ionization, send ions down into the space to attack and destroy germs. Active particle control, which makes the particles in the space clump together. So now they're bigger. So now these little viruses are clumped down with other crap. So they're bigger. So they either fall on the ground where we can vacuum them up or they're big enough they get sucked into the airflow and then make their way back to my filtration system. There's lots of things we can do. And each one of these, like I said, is another, another discussion that we can have. I do want to point out for you guys that have been looking at some of these types of technologies, especially bipolar ionization, which is really trendy right now. Um, it does make the MERV rating of your regular filter better. Now you don't get a new MERV rating because the MERV filter rating happens, the manufacturer of the filter rep, rep, ranks that, tests that. But if you add some of these things to it, you could do a better job. Specifically, can you catch SARS viruses, um, coronaviruses with these things? So if I took, for example, Ashtray's recommending a MERV 13 or more 14 filter, just that filter alone, MERV 13, I'm only gonna catch 46% of the, of, the, of the SARS virus. But if I combine that with a UV light, Maybe I can get rid of more. If I combine that with a, a bipolar ionizer, I can knock out a large chunk of those, 98%. And the same for a lot of these other scenarios. So if you can't put in the top of the line HEPA filtration, or you're concerned about the germs even making their way to the HEPA, you can put in something slightly not as good for the filtration, but combine it with something else like an ionizer to get a pretty effective filtration rate. The other and last thing I wanna pop, mention, and I'll pop up this last question is, I don't know if you guys saw this or not, or if you guys even care, but next week I have a series of five webinars directed at end users, so your customers. Uh, don't worry, I'm not selling them anything direct because I don't sell anything at all. Um, I just wanna educate people on how stuff works. So there are five of them, they're each one hour. The idea is most people would log into the first one on Wednesday, because it's kind of a general IAQ overview on how things work. And then depending on what they cared about, reopening their restaurants, reopening their indoor sporting venue, like fitness centers, gymnasiums, MMA rooms, whatever, uh, or reopening their school district, they would tend that one. So they tend the basic one, and then they would pick one of the other top. They can, they can tend all five if they want, but they pick the basic intro one, and then whatever kind of building they're concerned with, see what applications we can do specifically on that stuff uh, to get those buildings open a little bit better. I'm only focusing on, H, focusing on HVAC stuff. I'm assuming everybody right now knows how to wear a mask and all that stuff. Let's, what can we do from an HVAC standpoint? 
Last question. I apologize for going longer than I wanted to. Uh, it doesn't matter even what you answer for this. Every answer is correct, right? Uh, and for the people that uh, had to log off early, although you won't be hearing me say this, if you had to log off early, I'm going to count this as a correct answer because, well, I'm just going to cheat because I know I went longer. I went like eight minutes more than I was supposed to go. All right, any other questions that anyone wants me to try to address? Dang it, I did the same thing again. I left the quiz up. Dude, you are killing me, Holger. I'm the worst. All right, I'm gonna close this and I'll show you those last two slides I was talking about just in case. Dang it, man, I'm horrible. All right, looks like most people have answered, so I'm gonna close that. See, it's weird, I, I closed it, but it says that you guys can't see it still, or can't see the, uh, Dang, I don't know what the, I don't know what's going on there. You guys are still seeing. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Super weird. It's like I can't make the. Uh... Hmm. Damn. Do this. Switch monitors and see what happens. All right. I think I just tricked it somehow. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I was mentioning those three technologies, which I won't go through again. And that was the slide I was referencing uh, on how some things like, for example, ionization can make your filter better. So your MERV-13 is catching 46% of coronaviruses by itself. It can get 98% if I combine the filter, a MERV-13 filter with ionization, effectively making it three, four, five MERV points better than it really is supposed to be. I just use the filter alone. That's what you guys missed in terms of the slides. All right. Um, so if there's any other questions, feel free to type them in. I think almost all of them are basically saying that uh, I was an idiot and didn't put the right slide back up again. Or actually, in this case, I did put it up and it was like frozen. I don't know what's going on with that. If, it sounds about right, though, because the original... Uh, Trade Ally event with Peoples and North Shore Gas had some uh, technical glitches. So it seems right that this one would have a couple technical glitches too. All right, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I'm gonna leave it at that. If you, with or without your customers, wanna join us next week for this uh, reopening business uh, topic, please feel free to do so. If you didn't get spammed with me on email on it, you'll also find it on our website. All right, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it.